It is great to welcome you to worship. I hope that you were in Sunday school and were able to enjoy uh, kind of an introduction to the story. Um, adults, we have three different classes, so please be sure that you know you're welcome there. And I'm going to ask Matt Harbaugh to tell you a little bit more about that, if you would come on up. Yeah, good morning. As Dirk mentioned, we have three adult uh, ed classes going on on Sundays. Um, really important that, that you're there. Um, we will be going through the story. All three classes will be going through the story, just as we are doing here in worship. Um, uh, the three classes are Bethany and I, are, at, along with the Geary's, are teaching one in the cornerstone room, which is below the choir room. The second one, um, Rick Dayton and Chris Scheidler are teaching in the library for now, although space was pretty tight, so that, that may change, but for now it's in the library. And then Ted Wood and James Powell are teaching one in the chapel. Um, so please join us. It is really worth it, and um, uh, just there's so much to cover, and this is such a great place and great time to start. Um, secondly, I, I also just quickly wanted to make an announcement about nominating committee. Um, our officers and servant leaders of our church are elected by the congregation in November um, in recognition of God's call on these people's lives to serve our, our church. Um, the process really begins now. Uh, the nominating committee has uh, already been meeting and we are praying about these people and discerning God's will for who he's calling. But in your bulletins, there's a, this color sheet um, and you can put somebody, uh, the congregation has the opportunity to nominate somebody to bring to our committee so that we can consider them. Um, there's also, on the church website, there's a survey as well that you can take there. Um, please put uh, your name, the name of the nominee, and also um, why you've nominated the person. That's very helpful to the committee. Um, as you're thinking and praying for these people, um, do review the, there's a few scriptures on here um, uh, that, that go over the basis for these offices and also some of the qualifications for them and um, just uh, be praying, for, and more than anything, be praying for the work of the committee as we, uh, as we uh, work to listen for who God's calling. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Let me uh, ask those who are here in person, if you would sign the friendship pads that are in the pews, we'd love to know you are here, especially if you're family coming to hear the kids sing or whatever uh, your purpose of being here. And if you are online, please let me ask you to sign the virtual friendship pad. We're glad that you can join us, especially on the holiday weekend. It's wonderful that people can uh, tune in uh, from where they are and be a part of worship. wanted to uh, ask you to also pay attention to the prayer list that is in your bulletin. Let me update a few things. Shar Tomer's brother, Wendell, is now dealing with pancreatic cancer. So if you can remember him in your prayers. And also, um, Paul Cerny, a member of our church, went up to Minnesota for a, a funeral for his brother-in-law, had a, a heart incident. Um, Thursday, he had a stint put in in two balloons. And then this coming week, he'll have a TAVR, T-A-V-R, valve replacement procedure. Uh, so please pray for Paul. He's at the VA hospital in Minneapolis and his wife, Cheryl. They'll be there uh, through this and uh, ready to come home. But I know he would appreciate your prayers for that. Let's take a brief moment and stand and greet those around you. Find somebody you don't know and introduce yourself if you would, please.
So let me encourage you all to uh, continue uh, greeting one another following worship, but also let me remind you, those with children, after uh, the opening prayer, after the first hymn, there's a response that we'll sing, and at that time the kids can come down here and meet Mrs. Powell and others to go to Young Child in Worship if they would like. Uh, so uh, that is after the first hymn and opening prayer, uh, the kids can go to Young Child in Worship. We are so grateful to have some of our youngest open us up in worship this morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Friends, let's stand and sing our opening hymn, hymn number one, Holy, Holy, Holy. Thank you.
Let's pray together, friends. God, we are reminded this day that you and you alone are holy. You are the creator of all things, and you called it good. You have made us in your image and said it was very good. We thank you for your love that we know in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, and for the gift of the Holy Spirit who lives and among us and within us as the body of Christ. We gather this morning to remember to say thank you. Thank you for the breath of life. Thank you for the new life that we know in Christ. Thank you for the life together that we share in the church. We praise you because you are worthy of that praise, faithful in all your ways, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, merciful and kind. May our offering bring you honor this morning. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. seated. We just sang the truth that God is holy, and in his word from 1 Peter, he says this, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, you shall be holy, for I am am holy. Then in God's word it says in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he has passed over former sins, and he shows his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Would you join me in the unison prayer of confession? None of us is righteous or holy, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All of us have turned aside. Together we have become worthless. Not one of us does good, not even one. Our throats are open graves. Our tongues are used to deceive. Our mouths are full of curses and bitterness. Our feet are swift to run in paths of misery. And the ways of peace we do not know. There is no fear of God in our eyes. Forgive us, O God. Show your mercy to us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I wanted to share just a few passages from the New Testament in response to our confession. In Revelation it says this, Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. And in the Gospel of Mark, as Jesus is healing a man with an unclean spirit, the unclean spirit cries out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And finally, in Hebrews chapter 7, we read about Christ. Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. Former priests were many in number, 
because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently. He continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives and makes intercession for us. It's fitting that we should have such a high priest as Jesus, one who is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. The law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. seated. As we prepare to give our tithes and offerings, let us pray. God, you have been so generous to us. We have all that we need and even more. In gratitude for your generosity and also simply because you are God and deserve all that we can bring, we give you these offerings and ask that you use them in order to make your name and glory known here and throughout the world. To you be the praise forever. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Let us remain standing as we affirm together what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now come to God in prayer. Let us pray. God, you are the author of life and creator of all things. You alone are worthy of praise. We know that every good and perfect gift comes from you, so we have many reasons to give you thanks. Thank you, Lord, for being our refuge, for protecting us, and giving us someone to turn to when life gets hard. We thank you for being our provider, for taking care of every need, and most of all, our need for a savior. We thank you for Jesus, who has taken away our sin and given us the gift of new and eternal life. Give us eyes to see your goodness, grace, and mercy, and turn to you in thanks. Lord, as children have now returned to school and fall routines begin, we pray that your sovereign hand would guide all of our interactions. We pray for salvation for our kids, that you would reach out to them and they would receive your abundant grace through Jesus Christ. And we pray that that faith would inform their attitudes about school and work, influence who their friends are and how they treat their peers. And we pray that their desire would first and foremost be for you. Help us, God, as parents, grandparents, those who teach our kids, to do so with love and patience, constantly pointing them to who you are and teaching them to be confident in who they are as your loved children. God of all comfort, we pray for those who are scared, confused, or upset. We pray for those who have been affected by the hurricanes and ask that you assure them that they have not been abandoned or left alone. We ask that you give them perseverance through these days and weeks ahead. We also pray for those around the world who are in areas of war or conflict. We ask that you bring peace, not just physical peace, to those places and people but the peace that transcends all understanding and comes only from knowing Jesus. Lord, we know that when we call to you, you hear us and you answer. So we ask now that you hear the cries of our hearts for those who are struggling physically, mentally, or spiritually. God, you know what each person is going through, so we silently name them now and ask for your hand to be upon them. In all the circumstances of life, God, we give you thanks. We ask that you continue to teach us and correct us and increase our faith every day. And we thank you, God, for teaching us how to pray and for giving us words to say together 
hear us as we pray with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Friends, we are in um, the beginning of the story, and so I invite you to turn with me to Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 this morning. Uh, page 2 in your pew Bible. I hope you were at Sunday school and got a little bit of an overview. Um, there's no way to cover everything uh, in one message on a Sunday morning, so being a part of an adult education class uh, really, really matters. Last Sunday, I tried to get a jump start, and we talked, uh, we read Genesis chapter 1. And we simply were reminded that it is God who is creator, and we are creature. It sounds so simple, but it's so profound and such an important foundation uh, for our beginning. God is the creator. We are uh, the creature. So we're going to build on that a little bit this morning, but before we read from the Word of God, let me pray for us. Thank you, God, that you have not left us to our own thinking to determine what is right or wrong or true. Thank you, God, that you have not left us to our own imagination to think about who you are and how and why you have created the world and each of us. By your grace and in your wisdom, you have revealed to us what is right, good, and true. You have made yourself known to us in this written word we call Scripture and in the living word, who is Jesus. So open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts, that we would receive your truth and grace today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So let me ask you to look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It is the account of God's creation, and it says this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So this is a pretty significant place to start, that God created you and me in his image, male and female. It's how he made us. The question is always, what does it mean to be made in his image? And I hope that you will see that as we go through this uh, today. But let me continue to read for us, beginning uh, again in chapter 2, verse 15. So the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And I can't help but just pause for a moment, friends, on this Labor Day weekend to call your attention to this, that man was created to work. It is not the curse of the fall. It is part of being made in the image of God. So as you go back to work Tuesday, remember that. Our culture does not have a very biblical view of work. And there's a reason but as Christians, we should have a redemptive view of work. God made you and me to be productive, to be creative. And that's part of his image. Verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... You shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. So there's great freedom for the man to eat from all the trees in the garden, except one that God has prohibited and commanded him not to eat from. And God says that the consequence of disobeying the command not to eat from that tree is that he will die. 
What does that look like? Does that mean he stops breathing? Does that mean it's a physical, literal death? Well, maybe, perhaps, and it's more than that. In disobeying God, we cut ourselves off from him. And he, friends, is our breath of life. And if we separate ourselves from God through disobedience, we take away the very source of the breath of life that we have. And so we die, spiritually, not just physically. The Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, Wow. At last, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, because of what God has done, bringing the woman to the man, the man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Oh, how I want to stop there and talk about what it means to let your child go when they get married and to let them be one with their spouse, mothers and fathers, and have it as God intended and not hang on too long. But that's not the point today. The man and his wife were both naked and there was no shame. That's the line I want you to remember. No shame. No guilt. Chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. The serpent said to the woman, "Did did God actually say... You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. She was almost exactly right. God never mentioned about touching it, but he did forbid them from eating of that tree. The serpent is the personification of evil. Satan in disguise, if you want to think of it that way. And he is tempting the woman and the man here. And the beginning of temptation almost always begins with questioning what you know about the Word of God and what God said. Almost always. Temptation begins with not being certain or sure of what God had said. That's why adult education is so important, friends. How sure are we of what God has said? How vulnerable are we to being misled or deceived through temptation of the evil one? So the serpent says to the woman in verse 4, You will not surely die. 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the second step of temptation is a direct contradiction that God's word is not true. I know better, the serpent says. Surely you're not going to die. But you will be like God. And isn't that at the essence of our dilemma? Is that we want to be like God. We would like to be the one who decides what is right or wrong. We would like to say we get to determine what is true. We would like to be the ones who create ourselves in the image that we desire, not in the image of God. And in our contemporary culture, uh, the way that is often expressed is this. Well, that's my truth. You might have your truth, but I have my truth. Beloved, it's deception. It's deception. There is one truth, and God's the author of that truth. He's the giver of that truth. So the tempter, the deceiver, is working here. In verse 6 it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise... Boy, doesn't that all sound good? Appealing to all of your senses and desires and needs? It's still tempting, but now it says, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And all of a sudden, we've moved from temptation to disobedience from temptation to sin. And we call this the fall because now things have changed. No longer, as we're going to read, in fact, it says, the eyes of both of them were opened in verse 7 and they knew they were naked. And all of a sudden there was shame and guilt, appropriately so, And so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They could no longer be known by one another or be exposed and vulnerable for God to see who they are without shame because of their disobedience. And we live in that that world post-fall where shame and guilt are used to manipulate and empower and control all the time. But they made these coverings from the the leaves that were there, the fig leaves. But let me just suggest, fig leaves are temporary. They're not going to last very long. Verse verse 8 says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, listen, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Just when they needed to turn to God for help, they began hiding from God. I don't know about you, but that resonates with me. The Lord God called to the man and asked him, where are you? I love this. The all-knowing, almighty God asks the man where he is. He knew where he was. It reminds me of my children playing hide-and-seek in the house. They would go and hide, and they would hide right underneath the kitchen table where I could see them plainly, and I would say, where are you? Where are you? Just to play the game. But God here is giving the man a chance to come clean to own up to it, to step forward. The man says, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was 
afraid, rightly so. Because I was naked and I hid myself. I was afraid, I was naked, and I hid myself. Any counselor or therapist or anybody that's in counseling or therapy, we all recognize these three categories. Fear, the worrying about people really knowing who I am or intimacy or vulnerability. And third, hiding or running away. That is what counseling and therapy is based on. As a result of our brokenness in disobedience to God and His command. So God responds and says, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Again, rhetorical question, God knows. The man has a chance. And the man blows it and says, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. It's not my fault, God. It's her fault. She gave it to me. And by the way, you're the one that gave me the woman, so really it's your fault. No responsibility. No accountability for his action. Yeah, the devil made me do it kind of thing. Sound familiar? So God turns to the woman, and you would think she might do better. The woman, the Lord said, what is it that you have done? And she says, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Not my fault, God. He lied. I was misinformed. It was my kindergarten teacher's fault. It's the way my parents raised me. I'm not culpable for this. And by the way, since every creature was made by you, God, and the serpent is that creature, huh? Maybe it's your fault again. There's a brokenness and a reality. And it speaks even to how things unfold in our own lives today. But let me tell you the good news. And that is, despite the irresponsibility and the lack of accountability, despite trying to pass it off on other people, the man and woman are shown grace by God. In the midst of their shame, and when they are guilty as charged. This is what God does in verse 21, chapter 3. The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. God covered them with garments of skins far more permanent than the temporary fig leaves but also far more significant in that God is the one who provided for their very need. God covered their shame and their guilt so that they could be with one another, but also that they could be with God without being afraid, hiding, or feeling like they were naked. He covered them. This is God's first action of redemption. And it points to the promise of His grace that we find fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And let me show you how Jesus is right here in verse 21. Where did God get the garments of skins to provide the clothing for the man and his wife? from the beasts of the field that he created, from those creatures that were present. What do you have to do in order to get the skin of an animal to create clothing? They have to die. There's a sacrifice made by the animal to create the clothing of skin. 
Did that animal do anything to deserve death like the man and the woman did? No. They were innocent. The innocent animal sacrificed to cover the guilt of the man and the woman. John the Baptist says when he sees Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The only one who is holy, righteous, and innocent, Jesus, sacrificed for you, and for me, so that we don't have to be afraid of God, so that we don't have to worry about him knowing us and being vulnerable, so we don't have to run and hide from him or one another. We can live in the confidence that God has redeemed us in providing the Savior in providing the covering. Not only here in Genesis 3, but in the gift of his son, Jesus. Thanks be to God that while we were all called to be holy and we have all fallen short, there is one who remained holy so that he could be that innocent sacrifice, the Lamb of God, who is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, what a gift we have been given in Christ. Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, foretold from the very beginning when you acted in grace toward those who were disobedient, when you provided healing for the brokenness, when you offered reconciliation for those separated from you and one another, when you redeemed the sinful, the broken, with the sacrifice of the Holy One, who is Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen. So we have the privilege this morning of coming to the table and remembering and being reminded of who is holy and of God's grace provided for us in the Savior Jesus, His Son. We are not worthy. We are the man and the woman in Genesis, hiding, fearful, not wanting to be known. God says, here, let me provide what you need so that you don't have to be ashamed or guilty. So this table is a table of freedom and forgiveness. Freedom from that shame and forgiveness for our sin. It reminds us of the sacrifice of Jesus and his death on a cross. It's for everyone who believes, who puts their faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone for their salvation. So come. Come from wherever you are. Come and eat and know the love of God. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, set apart the bread and the juice today for their holy purpose, that they would be a sign and a symbol of the body and the blood of Christ, broken and shed on our behalf a seal of your love and grace that we know in Jesus. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of your son, the Savior. We pray in his name. Amen. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. After giving thanks to God, he blessed it. He broke it. He said to his friends, this is my body broken for you. Do this remembering me. Take and eat. This is the bread of life. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this remembering me. For every time you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Take and drink the cup of salvation. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you have provided the Redeemer. His name is Jesus. His obedient life has replaced the disobedient lives that we live. His sacrificial death has paid the penalty of the death we deserve. His glorious resurrection is our hope that sin has been overcome. Death is defeated. His promised return is the hope that we wait for, that all things will be made right in your time. We pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our final hymn. So remember, friends, wherever you are going this week, when you go back to work, maybe on Tuesday, uh, that you go there with purpose and with God's intention. And you don't have to go there in fear or with shame. 
or worrying that you might be found out. God has taken care of all of that in Christ. You are free to be the person he has made you and redeemed you to be. And wherever you are, he has you there to be that person. Person full of hope, joy, and peace. So wherever you are, God has you there to work in you and through you. And remember always, nothing, nothing, nothing separates you from the love of God in Christ. He has clothed you with the Savior's blood. He has provided all that you need. His love is greater. And may the gift of God in his son Jesus, his life, death, resurrection, his return, be your hope, for he is our salvation. May the Holy Spirit so fill you that the joy of Christ and the peace of Christ will flow and overflow today and every day. Amen. Amen.